Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Gina Martinez, and I'm the Events Marketing Manager at Springer Publishing. For those of you who don't know Springer Publishing, we are an award-winning publisher of nursing and healthcare content featuring books, apps, journals, and digital products. Today's webinar, Resilience, Relationship, and Advanced Practice Psychiatric Nursing, is being presented by Kathleen Wheeler. Dr. Wheeler is an advanced practice psychiatric nurse and a professor and director of the PMH NP program at Fairfield University Egan School of Nursing and Health Studies in Fairfield, Connecticut. Dr. Wheeler is a psychoanalyst and an EMDR trainer and consultant with expertise in treating trauma. Recently, she chaired the expert panel that developed trauma and resilience competencies for nursing education, which are now copyrighted and available online. She is on the editorial board of the Journal of the American Psychiatric Nursing, as well as on the editorial board of EMDR Journal of Practice and Research. Before we get started, I just want to mention that this webinar will be recorded. If you miss any portion of the presentation, you can find the video on Springer Publishing's website five to seven days post-event. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation. If you forget to ask a question, there will be a brief survey sent at the end of the webinar and you can include your question there. Now, without further ado, we will turn the presentation over to Dr. Wheeler. Thank you, Gina. I really appreciate the nice introduction and um, thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to be presenting for the next 40 minutes or so what I think is a user-friendly framework for psychiatric nursing practice. This framework extends Peplau's interpersonal theory for psychiatric nursing and includes recent neurophysiological research and theory on relationship attachment and resilience. I hope to illustrate the importance of relationship and resilience for regulation and for health. So we start out with this figure that sort of compares the paradigm of the allopathic medical model with holistic nursing model of care. The goal in holistic model of care is uh, to heal the person, heal uh, meaning uh, an Anglo-Saxon word that refers to making whole. So symptoms are seen as a communication of physiological dysregulation at a particular moment in time. While the allopathic model, the aim is to cure and symptoms are treated or ameliorated uh, with medication, where you see that's the main uh, thrust of this paradigm while in nursing, we use medication, but it's an adjunct to what we feel is central to nursing, which is your relationship with the patient as well as your own self-care. And self-care uh, means for us as well as enhancing the self-care of our patient. If we can't be there and care for ourselves, we can't really be there for another person. So building from this paradigm of holistic nursing, the framework I'm presenting today serves as a compass for building resilience for oneself and in your advanced psychiatric nursing practice for patients. Three basic concepts are important in the framework, resilience, relationship, and patient-centered. When I hear the term patient-centered, it always seems obvious to me, like, uh, no duh, who else would you be centered on? But if you think about how the office visit is usually structured these days, with data needing to be documented in a short amount of time, it's very hard to be patient-centered, as that implies that you'll just allow and follow the patient rather than setting an agenda and having tasks that you need to accomplish in each visit. So letting your interaction unfold according to the patient is not encouraged or practiced in most settings. The concept of resilience is integral 
to this model. And we're starting out with a definition, which is uh, from Elaine Miller Karras, who wrote Building Resilience to Trauma. And the definition is that resilience is an individual's ability to identify and use individual and collective strengths in living fully in the present moment and to thrive while managing the activities of daily living. So Elaine's model of resilience says that we all have a resilient zone and this is based on our nervous system. That is our nervous system charges and releases, charges and releases. And when we're in our resilient zone, uh, we're in a physiological internal state of adaptability and flexibility. It doesn't mean that we're always calm, but it means that you can have your feelings, but you don't feel like you're losing your head. Uh, you can be sad, but you're not washed away by a river of sorrows. The a resilient zone is optimal when our sympathetic and nervous system response is balanced uh, with our parasympathetic response serving as the brakes. And it means that we're physiologically regulated and not hyper aroused or hypo aroused. The sympathetic nervous system we know serves as sort of the gas pedal and accelerates uh, our arousal level. Um, and these are all functions on this slide of our autonomic nervous system, which you probably remember um, studying uh, as an undergraduate, affecting every system of our body. Um, that's the old model of the autonomic nervous system because Stephen Porges has further researched the autonomic nervous system and says that actually we have three branches, not two, and that these three branches are phylogenically sequential and reflecting increasing survival effectiveness at each stage. So this slide shows um, our nervous systems first reaction uh, to our environment is curiosity and engagement. And this is mediated by a branch of the parasympathetic nervous system that he calls the myelinated ventral vagus nerve. Um, and the second reaction, this, in this reaction, we're sort of curious and open to what's happening. The second reaction is if we sense a threat or a danger and this is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. And this um, mobilizes us for fight or flight. Uh, the third reaction is also mediated by uh, the parasympathetic system, but it's termed the dorsal vagal, uh, ventral vagal, non-myelinated vagus nerve. This is when we sense that we're in a life-threatening situation. And so the response is freezing or feigning death. Um, the polyvagal theory, which places emphasis on social engagement as an essential component of staying healthy physically and psychologically. So this occurs when we are in our resilient zone. Um, he, Porges, coined the term neuroception to reflect our unconscious scanning of the environment. Even though we're not aware of it, we walk into a room or a situation and our brain is like, hmm, am I safe here? Is there a threat? Feeling safe is a necessary prerequisite uh, before we can really use social support, relationship, and connection. Um, because in order to be in our zone, we have to feel that um, we are um, in the real resilient zone and feeling safe. So what's determined threatening is really what we perceive as threatening. So one person might perceive one situation as uh, 
threatening and another person might not. It really depends on the person to a large extent, although there are some uh, traumas that we all agree on that are threatening. I'm gonna talk about those in a minute. This slide sort of illustrates uh, the various names for the various zones of arousal, with this being the, in the middle, the resilience zone, or another name is therapeutic window of tolerance or therapeutic window of arousal. And you can see the hyperarousal of the sympathetic system, fight or flight, and then the unmyelinated dorsal vagal parasympathetic system of hypoarousal. The, when we feel threatened, uh, our nervous system becomes dysregulated. So we get knocked out of our resilience zone into either hyperarousal and may have symptoms of being irritable, edgy, anxious, panicky, uh, angry, panicked, uh, pain, or we can get stuck on our low zone, which I said was mediated by the parasympathetic system. And these physiological states are depression, sadness, isolation, exhaustion, or numbness. These are the different uh, types of trauma with Big T traumas being traumas that we uh, kind of call the criterion A traumas for PTSD. So these are events that occur that we kind of all agree would be very threatening and are there's a consensual agreement that these are disturbing and dysregulating our nervous system. But there's also things called little t traumas. Little t traumas are things that are not as obvious. For instance, attachment misattunements. So these include things um, that didn't happen that should have happened. So errors of omission can also include uh, any invasive medical or dental procedures, um, isolation, uh, which uh, interestingly enough, um, little t traumas have been shown to have just as many PTSD symptoms as big T traumas. So not to underestimate these as causing uh, physiological dysregulation. And then you have the cumulative traumas, which include systemic racism, poverty, homophobia, bullying, um, as well as multiple deployments. And then of course, uh, vicarious trauma or witnessing trauma, which is what nurses do pretty much every day. Um, what happens when a person perceives a situation as threatening or traumatic? Well, information processing in our brain is interrupted. And this in turn activates the nervous system and dysregulates our nervous system. So it's as if in our infinite wisdom, our brain is going, Shh, don't forget this, this is important and sort of imprinting it or uh, branding your brain uh, with the memory. So thereafter, the nervous system is primed to react to triggers to that event or a similar event that uh, in the future is similar to that physiological state. So the information that uh, from the event is stored dysfunctionally in the brain in sort of a frozen, disconnected, state from other healthier memory networks. Unlike dysfunctionally stored memories, most memories are stored adaptively. That is, you might have uh, something disturbing happen, you talk to a friend, you feel a little better, and it gets integrated into your other neural networks. And the neural networks are kind of 
and oh. happily connecting with other neural networks in our brain. So this is termed adaptive information processing or AIP. So there's access to all components of the memory or the information, and it's flowing from one neural network to another. Healing can occur as the dysfunctional, formerly disrupted uh, neural networks are recreated and connected with constructive adaptive memory networks. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, so AIP posits that we have an inherent information processing system that usually processes experiences to a physiological integrative state where information is taken in and learning occurs. These distributed information processing sy systems are throughout the brain and display synchronized oscillations. That is neural network uh, in train or become as one to each other via their action potential. So one neural network might stimulate another neural network and that if there is um, not a disturbing memory or event that gets sequestered off, that these neural networks are happily connecting with each other and operating efficiently so that memory stored in a way that's connected with the rest of the brain. Um, these healthy systems of adaptive memory networks are reflected in how robust our resilience zone is. So though looking at the bottom figure here, this is uh, a robust resilience zone where there's many adaptive memory networks. You see how wide it is. So the person has a higher tolerance for stress or um, things that happen and will not get knocked out as easily from their resilience zone. The person with a narrow resilience zone in contrast, may have had a lot of previous developmental uh, traumas growing up or current traumas that have kind of narrowed their capacity, if you will, to handle disturbing adverse events. So this person may more easily be knocked out of their resilience zone. Um, this slide just shows kind of the sequence of events that happens when a disturbing event or trauma occurs. And there's long thalamic fibers in the brain that transfer the information throughout different parts of the brain, uh, which we're not going to go into uh, in a lot of depth because we don't have time. But um, you can see some of the structures like the locus ceruleus, which is where norepinephrine uh, is stored and as well as working its way up to what we call the OFC, which actually figures out how to respond to the threat. And then of course the hypothalamus so that um, the HPA axis is gonna affect every organ of our body. You saw that in the previous slide that illustrated the autonomic nervous system. Um, so traumatic events are stored in what we call implicit procedural or unconscious memory, and they're spread across the brain. Memory is not located in one part of the brain. It really depends on the memory, for instance, the occipital lobe is visual, temporal lobe is sound, so that these long thalamic fibers uh, link neural networks. And if the what's happened is um, traumatic, the memory is gonna get stored as a fragment. And I said before that you can get triggered, right, by something similar. So perhaps there's a sound uh, thinking um, or a smell or an image or a body sensation similar to the original disturbance, the original event, and that can spark that neural network to relive, if you will, the memory fragment. So this seemingly comes out of nowhere and the person may not even be aware that it's held in their implicit memory. 
thinking about, um, you know, somebody that's been in war and they hear the helicopter overhead, they might be triggered and think they're right back in the war zone. Uh, each of these memories are kind of um, a, a capsule, if you will, that holds somatic sensations, your autonomic nervous system sensations, as well as emotional um, sensations or feelings. This is an example of a nurse who has many different capsules of traumatic neural networks uh, due to COVID-19. She is um, a psychiatric nurse whose unit was changed to a COVID unit um, when COVID started and she didn't really know how to take care of people on respirators, but um, that was a big changing practice trauma that was overwhelming for her. Um, this is, uh, is kind of a metaphor for the capsules of trauma that are stored in the brain that are taking up space. She also um, quit her job for a while and suffered financial loss, so didn't, wasn't able to support her family. Uh, before that, she had what we're calling now moral injury, much as soldiers have, where she had to do things that uh, conflicted with her value system. For instance, she had really knew how to help people in, engage the family when people died. And now she was faced with not allowing any family to help the person because of the institution's rules. Um, and she uh, really suffered greatly with giving what she considered inferior care to her patients. She was also uh, very disturbed about her risk of exposure. She's got little kids. Little kids now are doing online school. Uh, that was disturbing. She's supposed to be there and help them. And she didn't really, um, know how to do that. Uh, and then of course the social isolation. So you can see with each capsule that is taking up space in your neural networks, um, you don't have a whole lot of time left to be in the present moment that you are being, um, um, your neural networks and the trauma are being stored dysfunctionally and it's very hard to stay in your resilient zone. This is sort of just a diagram that kind of captures what happens when we're triggered and getting knocked out of our resilient zone. So she'd come home from work and she'd eat a whole cheesecake and then she'd feel terrible and she'd sink down from being uh, distressed and hyper aroused to being hypo aroused and feeling like, oh my God, I'm a failure. I can't believe I did that. So she would then sort of hang around here uh, feeling depressed. And then she would vacillate back and forth in and out, always trying to get in her resilience zone, but not being able to because she was being kind of yanked around by various symptoms that were, um, uh, disruptive and dysregulating her nervous system. This slide, um, you know, shows coping strategies. Now, I know when we think of coping strategies, I always think of healthy things like exercise, eating right, uh, social support. However, our brain is wired for survival and people cope the best way they can. So all of the above reflect various coping strategies for those who have suffered adverse events and trauma. And all of these are efforts to help manage changes in physiological arousal. So these strategies help the person to not feel, not know, and avoid the real root cause of their problems and form pathways in the brain which become familiar. They become the person's sort of go-to default responses um, during times of stress. So all of these reflect symptoms 
of a dysregulated nervous system with the root cause being adverse events, trauma of some kind. Um, okay. The, uh, so when we think of ways to help others, we're gonna talk now about relationships and how we can help people in terms of regulating their nervous system. But um, we start with our own self-regulation. We wanna enhance our patient's ability to make what is termed a state change. That is to be able to change from a physiological state of being um, knocked out of our resilience zone, hyper or hyper aroused to a regulated state within the resilience zone. So we want to activate positive emotions and experiences. So relational co-regulation occurs when we're calmed, reassured, and supported by others. And we know from both animal and human research, attachment research in particular, that we're wired for relationships and that relationships do regulate our physiological arousal. And this is essential uh, to be in the resilience zone. So co-regulating through our therapeutic relationship. There is abundant research that the therapeutic relationship determines the outcome of treatment and foundational to psychiatric nursing is our therapeutic relationship with the patient. So there's many strategies um, that cultivate a therapeutic relationship, uh, some of which are, uh, you know, asking about the patient's main concerns, setting collaborative goals, ensuring safety. Um, if you're doing therapy, maintaining the frame is essential in terms of confidentiality, boundaries, um, minimal self-disclosure. Uh, adhering to the frame, the time of the session, validating the person's feelings. And along with that is really explaining about this model, about the resilience zone. So education, that it's not diagnosing, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what's happened to you, that you've had a number of things that have been so disturbing and dysfunctionally stored in your nervous system that has caused this dysregulation. Um, and being a witness and a therapeutic presence for the person and teaching the person skills so they can track their own nervous system. So as your relationship evolves, that the patient is becoming attached and these are relational templates in the brain and uh, can help to co-regulate the person in your presence. And this also provides a portal of um, opportunity, if you will, to access implicit memory. Uh, attachment research in theory, I like this metaphor of um, us holding the patient. And both optimal development and effective psychotherapy promote an expansion. This is Alan Shore's quote of the biological substrate of the human unconscious, which he says is the right brain. And that's the dynamic core of the implicit self. So that through your relationship with the patient, uh, it um, parallels or um, recapitulates, if you will, optimal development, which uh, may not have occurred for your patient. Now, this is sort of the overall treatment hierarchy to keep in mind. Think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So that physiological, it superimpose that on this figure so that um, physiological needs and safety needs must be met first. So increasing external resources, doing case management, finding the person, you know, someplace to live or 
food may be your first order of business. Um, once that the person is externally stabilized, then we begin to increase internal resources. And the internal resources are aimed towards helping the person to regulate themselves and helping the person to uh, supply resources to widen their resilience zone. And finally, this, these are all stabilization strategies. And then the person can be ready for processing. Uh, processing means um, putting the fragmented components of the memory and to uh, restore them and integrate them with adaptive memory networks. And then the person can be ready to uh, really enhance their future visit, uh, visioning. So I presented that in that slide as sort of a stage model, stabilization and then processing. But actually, uh, it's more accurately portrayed as in the treatment process with phases of stabilization, processing, stabilization, processing, and all leading to greater integration. Integration within the cell, integration of neural networks, adaptive with dysfunctional neural networks, and positive experiences. So there'll be deeper connections with oneself and with others. So what I'd like to spend a few minutes on now is talking about a recent patient I saw, um, we'll call her Jill, 39 year old nurse who was faced with many challenges that dysregulated her nervous system um, since COVID particularly. So uh, she came in with a lot of anxiety and depression and said she was irritable, couldn't sleep, drinking more wine at night to relax. Um, so explained to her how she was getting knocked out of her resilience zone because of all the changes the pandemic had brought her way. And then we worked together over six months, uh, integrating some strategies uh, above as well, I'm gonna tell you what that was, as well as helping her, which helped her to stay in a resilient zone. So she was already had resources, she had good health and a loving extended family. But you can see by this balance that as the um, trauma, the adverse events uh, decreased her ability to self-regulate, she was kind of out of whack. So what we needed to do was increase more resources. So some of the resources that we increased to enhance her self-regulation was, uh, she suggested this, um, not watching the news at night, uh, figuring out how to exercise 30 minutes a day, um, connect with her family, um, that her extended family was very loving and doing deep breathing a couple of times a day. Um, we also did um, therapy with trauma processing, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And this helped her uh, to process significant trauma she had had from her past and helped her to reconnect those dysfunctionally stored memories into more adaptive memory networks. Um, this is, uh, so I worked with her over a period of about six months and she was feeling much better. I had given her the Beck depression inventory and an anxiety scale and both of which improved um, significantly. And also subjectively, she said how much better she felt her anxiety went way down. Um, this is slide I put in here just to illustrate how PTSD or trauma um, is a traumatic brain injury that it actually shows up on a uh, functional MRI as activated brain areas. This is not a happy brain here. 
So this is a brain scan before EMDR, and this is a brain scan after that. The blue areas are uh, quieter areas in the brain. And so the brain has uh, been, if you will, deactivated. So these are all positive changes uh, reported once trauma has healed and the person has integrated neural networks that we know this from the research that actually post-traumatic growth can occur. And this is reflected in a more robust resilient zone. So some of the things, um, appreciation of the value of life, increased feelings of self-reliance and personal strength, improved relationship. The person uh, might realize and have a shift of priorities and might uh, develop new interest. And we, I think we can see some of these uh, changes uh, in what's happening, you know, with the pandemic, with the people reevaluating, you know, is this really where I want to work? Is this what I want to do? And um, changing um, to, you know, their employment or their life situation. So I uh, wanted to leave time for questions. So I wanted to thank you so much for your attention. I can't see any of you, but uh, I'd like to answer questions now. And I think Gina is going to yes. help us with that. If anybody has any questions that you want to ask in the chat room. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Wheeler, for that great presentation. And I want to thank everybody who participated with us today. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in. The first one is, what are some strategies that might help to stabilize a patient? Um, okay, uh, good question, because there's a lot of strategies that I'm sure the people in the audience are already using uh, with their patients. And it's essentially helping a person to make what we call a state change, changing your physiological state from one of, um, you know, sympathetic hyperarousal or hypoarousal into a calmer, um, more balanced state. So some of these might be things like mindfulness, um, bibliotherapy, having the person read, um, self-help books, CBT is a good one, uh, stress, all stress management techniques, um, medication certainly can be an adjunct to helping the person, um, DBT techniques, things that manage physiological arousal. Some of the things might be um, imagery exercises, um, there's journaling, grounding, um, with my patient I presented, uh, what she did was uh, exercise 30 minutes a day, fast walking. Uh, you can also do deep breathing exercises. And there's also other strategies that uh, Stephen Porges talks about where he talks about just simple things like uh, rocking, um, and soothing gestures, um, weighted blankets, um, massage, uh, music certainly can change your physiological state, uh, chanting or praying, um, drumming, music, I think I mentioned that. Um, so other strategies, psychotherapy, of course, can also help. But any strategies that help regulate the autonomic nervous system. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here is, what exactly does processing mean in your treatment hierarchy? Um, okay, so at the beginning, you know, I talked about how the memory stored dysfunctionally and fragmented. So the components of the memory get disconnected from each other. So processing is going to connect the memory components that have been fragmented and stored dysfunctionally in neural networks. 
um, and link them to adaptive memory networks. So you have to be able to make a state change in order first to proceed with processing. So processing uh, is going to be um, things like cognitive processing therapy. Um, it can also process through journaling. Uh, what I did, EMDR therapy, uh, group therapy, body and energy work, ego state therapy, uh, psychodynamic supportive therapy. So processing is really connecting those dysfunctional memory networks with adaptive uh, memory networks and making significant what we call trait changes. It's not just changing from one physiological state to another in that moment in time. It's really making deeper changes in implicit memory systems and um, part of that is through forming a narrative so that the what's implicit becomes explicit and it essentially restores consciousness so that healing occurs as formerly disrupted neural networks are recreated and reconnected with adaptive memory networks. Now, if the person doesn't have a lot of adaptive memory networks because of developmental trauma or um, uh, things that have happened to them, then you might spend a longer time in the stabilization phase. You may need to help the person in order to build up those adaptive memory networks. All right, and I think we have just, let me just check just one more question. Um, do you think that most mental health problems and psychiatric disorders are due to trauma? Um, yes. Um, I think that unless there is something due to an organic uh, cause that most um, psychiatric disorders are due to um, dysregulation. And it's trauma is increasingly understood to have a relationship, you know, with the development and the severity of mental illness. And we all know about the ACE study, which kind of illustrates um, the long-term effects of early trauma on later health, both mental health as well as physical health. Um, so that the way this occurs in the context of trauma is that in early life, uh, it affects the developing brain. And so in early life, there are essentially existential threats to existence, right? Which require coping strategies that prioritize survival. But when you're young, you don't really have those coping strategies yet. So that um, I don't think we want to get into all the physiology about this, but that the dysregulation that occurs um, can is a core component, I think, of the majority of psychiatric disorders and mental health problems. I don't know if that answers yeah. it. Yeah, I think that, that's good. Uh, one other question just popped up. Um, how effective is EMDR for treating PTSD in veterans? And what does recent research show? Um, great question. It's uh, considered a level A treatment for PTSD. It's in practice guidelines by um, the WHO, the APA, uh, the VA as um, a level A treatment, meaning you know one of the best things to treat PTSD. Um, and you can go on the VA website and see that. I just got a call actually from the VA. They wanted, uh, e I'm an EMDR trainer. So I'm a big proponent of EMDR because it's uh, quick and effective and is included in many international as well as national 
practice guidelines as uh, one of the best treatments uh, for PTSD, but it's used in many other things. Uh, since many other things, the underlying problem is based on a adverse event or a dysregulation of the nervous system that you can use EMDR. It's not, uh, for instance, if you have a patient that came in, I uh, had one patient with dyslexia. Well, it didn't cure his dyslexia, obviously, but what it did was help him with self-esteem problems and uh, with problems that had evolved from a very early age when he felt you know, that something was wrong with him and he was bullied and made fun of because he couldn't read correctly. So even though EMDR, of course, didn't fix the dyslexia, it did help him to figure out uh, how to process other earlier trauma that deeply affected his ability to function uh, in a healthy way as an adult. Hmm. That's good. Staying on the EMDR topic, here's another question. What is the difference between EMDR and brain spotting? Um, brain spotting um, is, um, was kind of evolved from um, a person, actually David Graham, that is an EMDR therapist. And he um, further developed a uh, technique that refined, he thinks, refined EMDR. There's not the evidence base for brain spotting as there is for EMDR, and I haven't taken uh, his trainings, but the colleagues I know that are EMDR therapists that have uh, think that brain spotting is uh, very effective. And there's a number of sort of offshoots of EMDR um, that have evolved by uh, through EMDR therapists uh, refining um, ways to treat trauma that are kind of based on EMDR. I don't know if that completely answers the question, but since I haven't taken brain spotting training, mm -hmm. most people um, start when they want trauma training to take uh, EMDR, and you can go to the emdria.org website, and there's the trainings are all listed there if uh, somebody's interested in getting that training. I've integrated EMDR training into the curriculum for my Psych MP students, so it's part of their coursework. So they all are uh, EMDR trained um, when they graduate, and they use the framework for practice, you know, that I just developed. I think it's really important that psych MPs have kind of a trauma-informed uh, framework for practice so that when they graduate and go out there, they're uh, conceptualizing things through a trauma-informed lens and it's gonna help them so much so they can know what to do and how to take care of the patient, even if they're, I want to say, only prescribing, because a lot of the uh, jobs for psych MPs are about prescribing, um, which is fine because that's going to help stabilize the patient. But I think having the bigger framework of, you know, what's going on for this patient can open up many uh, other opportunities and a plethora of therapeutic techniques that you can continue to learn even after you've graduated and um, use as long as you have kind of an overarching meta framework for practice. All right, thank you. Um, all right, that wraps up the questions for this webinar. Uh, if you could just go to the next slide. Um, if you're interested in seeing sample chapters of Dr. Wheeler's book, Psychotherapy for the Advanced Practice Psychiatric Nurse, or the accompanying case study approach to psychotherapy for advanced practice psychiatric nurses, visit uh, www.springerpub.com. 
To purchase copies of Dr. Wheeler's book and case study with a 25% off discount and free shipping in the United States, use discount code WEBINAR25 at checkout on SprinterPub.com. As a reminder, today's event was recorded and will be posted on www.SprinterPub.com backslash videos in five to seven business days. If you registered for this webinar, you will receive an email with the link to the recording as soon as it's available. Thank you again for attending today's event. We hope to see you at future Springer Publishing webinars. Stay safe. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Wheeler. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it.